Today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word. So I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I'm God's servant. I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. full trust and my full love and I believe you will bless me more so I can give more in Jesus name Amen Just want to welcome you to talk number seven of the series, Exodus, yes. And I want to preach the message. Are you ready? Come up to the mountain. Can you tell somebody beside you, come up to the mountain? <laughs> That's right. Before we explore talk seven, I want to share a little bit more personally with you. Many moons ago, my wife and I were still, you know, a few years into our married life. It was a Sunday night. I was driving home and my wife was in the back seat with our two energizer bunnies <laughs> all drained out and they were sleeping on her lap. And it was nine in the evening on a Sunday and we were bone tired because the whole day we, we were serving. We went to mass. I led the prayer meeting. I preached in the servants gathering. And then in the dinner, there was this fellowship with other community members and then I heard a voice from the back seat. It was my wife. She asked a question. And the question was this. Bo, sometimes I just wish our life was a little bit normal. Like we didn't have all these responsibilities for other people. I didn't see that question coming. That question pinched my heart because it was true. We were not living a normal life. I mean, what is normal? Normal is working from Monday to Friday. And then you could be able to rest on Saturday, like have a picnic in the park. And then on Sunday, stroll in the mall. But because of ministry and also because of my personal businesses, like I set up some businesses, weekends were the busiest days of the week. It's like Saturday retreat, seminar, etc. 
Sundays preaching at the feast. And, you know, it, it, it was really tough. And, and so now I, I remember it's like, okay, half of the time I'd be able to bring them with me. Half of the time, you know, they, they, they would be left behind. About eight or nine times of the year, I would travel. And again, it's half, half, half the time they, they're left behind. Half the time I bring them along with me. And because the kids were tiny, it would be always pandemonium. Can you imagine me pushing a cart with eight luggages, giant light luggages, two pulling bags, and then my wife carrying a baby in her arms, and then <laughs> our little boy running around and asking, are we there yet? Okay. So you get the picture now, but. Here's, here's something I, I need you to realize. Even if my schedules was crazy, from Monday to Friday, I would prioritize family time, like dates with my wife, dates with my boys, family dinners, family trips. It, it was there. It was there, okay? But still, it's, it's really a question. Her question is very valid. She, she was basically asking, what, you know, can we focus on our family first? You know, we're, we're responsible for this, that person, that, that group, that, you know, and it, it was there. And I, so I asked her this question. I said, do you want me to stop serving? And <laughs> I remember her answer. She said, don't mind me, Bo. This is just muy muy. And she says, you know, after a day, I'll be okay. I want you to know I have no hope of translating muy muy in English, okay? <laughs> but the general idea is that she was just verbalizing her emotions. And what I have learned is that when she is in that state, I will not try to solve muy muy. Instead, I will wait for her to arrive home, and then I listen to her, and I hug her. That's it. And she said something else after that. She said, you know, Bo, before I married you, you were already like this, serving God. This is who you are. And I knew this, and I knew what I was getting into. And th that, that for me was, was absolutely beautiful. And I, I, I said, yeah, um, I want you to know this, that she, I, I remember she said this, even if our life is more difficult, I wouldn't want it any other way. We, our family, we've embraced this more difficult, stressful life intentionally. In one sense, we deliberately climbed up the mountain. And after almost 25 years of married life, I look back at our abnormal life with profound gratitude. My greatest rewards, both of my sons love to serve the Lord. I have an amazing marriage with my wife because the best relationship are not two people looking at each other with googly eyes, but two people facing one direction, walking towards one mission. And plus, <laughs> I have the greatest lifelong friends um, because I'm serving the Lord in community. If given a chance to relive my life, I would still embrace our more difficult life all over again. With that sharing, I want you to listen to this powerful message, talk number seven of our Exodus series. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Bo. I want to highlight what he just said. Given a chance, he would do it again. He would embrace that difficult life. And he was mentioning about the rewards. And it's very encouraging to hear our founder saying that it is a difficult life. Who's having a difficult time? So one big message for today is climb up the mountain. Can you say that, please? Yes, climb it up. There is effort. There is work. We're always... We're always just looking what it feels what it looks like on top of the mountain. 
majestic view, diff, a fantastic perspective. But there's work there, climbing up the mountain. And you need to make that decision today. It is a little bit intimidating. I'm not fit enough. I'm not good enough. It's hard. But Bo, sum it up. If I'll do it again, I'll climb up the mountain. Today, we'll unpack one of the most momentous events in biblical history. And that is God making covenant with Israel. This is the time that the covenant is taking place on top of the mountain called Mount Sinai. Everybody say, Mount Sinai. Do you remember just a few weeks ago, we were able to preach that, you know, Mount Sinai is not new to us. It's the same mountain where Moses encountered God for the first time. Remember that what was burning at that time? The burning bush, correct. That is where God revealed Himself. Today, we're going to see something burning again. And I'll give you a suspense about it. But we'll go through it. There's something on that mountain. It's a mountain of God. And we have three messages that we will unpack for you today. Are you ready? Yes. I'm not sure. Are you ready? Yes. Message number one. God rescued you for a twofold purpose. Say that with me. God rescued you for a twofold purpose. God rescued Israel, the people of Israel, the people of God for a purpose. And yes, there was pain going through it. Exodus says, read it with me if you could see it on the screen. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai. And Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Where were they? They were in front of the mountain. And I could imagine that they, the Israelites must have been in a... The experience was they are in, they are in the mountain, in front of the mountain, where they heard that their leader Moses met God. That's where God met Moses, and Moses met God, and it must be a very special time. The, the, the stories that I hear, this is the place. Can you, are you with me? Can you feel that with me? And, and when God tells Moses that He wanted the covenant with His people, covenant, everybody say covenant. Covenant is more than a contract. It's not a contractual thing. Covenant is so much more and you can think of it as a marriage between God and His people. Everybody say covenant. And here it is. Read it on the screen with me, please, together. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Everybody say, kingdom of priests. Well, it's a, it's, what a beautiful covenant, what a beautiful invitation of a relationship. Not just a contract, but a covenant. You know, you see, God didn't rescue His people so that His people will just live ordinary lives. There is a purpose for it. God rescued them for a twofold purpose. And here they are, to be in a relationship with Him. And secondly, be a kingdom full of God's images. Let me say that again. We are called by God. To live extraordinary lives, not just ordinary, not just, you know, we, God did not rescue us and is rescuing us just to live a mundane, hmm, nothing. God has two things. Number one, be in a relationship with Him and 
kingdom full of God's images. And, you know, to be His representatives on earth. As priests, kingdom of priests. You know, a priest is, especially in ancient culture, a priest is this, that person that mediates between God and man. And imagine, God is not just calling Moses as the priest. God is calling the whole nation as priests to mediate God and man. That is a beautiful purpose. Everybody say purpose. Going back to the previous book in Genesis, when God created mankind, He already made this purpose very clear. We are to dwell with God in the garden. And secondly, we are His co-rulers. Stewardship of His creation. Hyperlink, it's the same thing. But we all know what happens. Sadly, man failed. We all fail. Raise your hand if you have failed. Raise your hand if you have sinned. But God didn't give up on us. From Adam and Eve, He called Abraham. Abraham and his family to be his representatives. Do you remember those feast stops that we just had? And that family of Abraham grew into a nation. But it won't be easy. The Israelites have been slaves for 430 years. They didn't know how to rule. They didn't know how to represent God. And what God does is His loving way to teach us. And sometimes teaching is best through testing. So here it is. The first part of our purpose is to enjoy God. Twofold purpose. The first part is to really in a relationship with Him and to enjoy Him. God wanted to make a covenant, a special relationship between Him and His people. But the foundation of any relationship is always based on contracts. No. The foundation of any relationship is based on trust. You will be in a relationship, a good, long-standing, loving relationship with trust. Without trust, there is no relationship. And these people, as we have seen again and again, God called us, God rescued us, but there are times that we do not trust God. Thus, God tested the nation through the wilderness, out of Egypt, through the wilderness. And now, God is teaching us again, teaching the nation again, giving them another big test. And He asked everybody to go up the mountain. He gives instructions to Moses. So here it is from Exodus 19. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up the mountain. Everybody say, come up the mountain. But sadly, or slight problem that we see here. Let's read further. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn and all the people trembled. Instead of celebrating, they trembled. Moses led them out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. So, did they climb the mountain? No, they trembled. <laughs> they did not even try. <laughs> they remained at the foot of the mountain. They were trembling. Why? It, here's what happened. Let's read further. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke. I want you to imagine this. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. There was fire. The mountain is on fire. The mountain is burning, not just a burning bush, but a burning mountain. The smoke billowed in the sky like smoke from a brick kiln. And the whole mountain shook violently. 
The whole mountain was on fire. And this time, God was not on a burning bush. He was on a burning mountain. That's scary. But that's actually the test. God wants you to grow closer to Him. It was holy ground when Moses approached the burning bush. It was just a bush. So it was Moses and God. But here, the invitation is, it's a whole mountain. God has expanded His holy ground for all of us to come in. But we got terrified. The nation got so afraid. They trembled. Yes, the thunder, the fire, the rumbling had a purpose. It was a test. God wants us to be closer to Him, to enjoy Him, to enter Eden and walk with Him in the garden. But first, are we really willing to climb up the mountain? Are you willing to climb up the mountain and really go into that mountain where you see smoke, darkness, not so clear, there's thunder, there's, it's quaking. God's people said at that time, no, thank you. They refused to go up. So let's read further. If on the screen, you can read it. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But we do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The answer key is already given to the test. Do not be afraid. But what did the people decide to do? They remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. It is one of the most depressing moments in the story. It is, it is an invitation, expanded space for a holy ground, for everyone to come in. Not just Moses, not just the elders, but the whole mountain is for everybody to come in. And yes, there was thunder, there was lightning. They refused to go up. They refused to grow closer to God. They got afraid. Why? Here's something that helps us understand this further. Mount Sinai. Everybody say Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is divided into three parts. The foot of the mountain the way up the mountain, and the fiery summit of the mountain. The foot of the mountain, the way up, and the fiery summit of the mountain. It parallels with the three parts of the temple in Jerusalem and the Garden of Eden. Because the garden was structured like the temple. The fiery summit of Sinai parallels the Holy of Holies in the temple and the tree of life in the garden. That's so Bible nerdy stuff. But I had to say it because it is all one same message. So we can appreciate it. The Israelites didn't want to climb up. Moses climbed up on their behalf. A priest mediating God in His people. This derails the second part of the purpose why God called us. Second part of the purpose is to represent God. Instead of becoming a kingdom of priests, Israel became a kingdom with priests. The opportunity, the call, the sayang, missed it. But this was not God's original plan. He wanted everyone to become priests. But not everybody wants to climb up the mountain. God wanted to recreate an entire new people, entire new nation, new humans, new God images, new representatives. But to do that, everyone had to climb up the mountain 
and on top of the God's mountain, you will meet the meeting point with God. God's face and man's face, God's heart and man's heart all together, which here's the second message of this talk. God's fire will transform you. Can you say that, please? God's fire will transform you. Human behavior. I totally would understand why the Israelites did not go up the mountain. They remained at a distance. It was a burning mountain with lightning, with, with thunder, with quaking. <laughs> so, when you see something like that, we just want to stay where we are. We want to be comfortable. We don't dare. Even if it means growing closer to God. We don't. We clearly have feelings like this now, pop culture. It happens. Even in the feast, the imagery is so, it's so clear. I cannot count. When I invite people to the feast, and I always, I, there is always one who would always say, out of a hundred, there's a good majority of people who would say, no, no, I cannot go to your religious event. No, it's a, it's a, a community. No, 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 no. Masusunog ako dyan. I'm gonna get burned there. Ako, they feel that they are too sinful and their image of God, they think that God will strike them dead. They think that, that, that God will, you know, judge them and, and make them really feel so small. But that is a lie. That is the lie of the devil. And that's the truth is, God's fire does not burn you. It burns what is destroying you. We embrace and go through the fire because fi the fire of God is not meant to burn us out. It is meant to burn the impurities that are with us, to destroy what is destroying us. God is not here to destroy us. God is destroying what is destroying us. It's so loving. It burns our sins that are making us less human. God, through His fire, His love, His fire, the fire of His love will make us better, not bitter. The fire of God heals us more than it hurts us. What we think is good may not really be good. So, let me backtrack a little bit. Remember the tree in Genesis? The tree of, no, the tree of knowing good and bad? Remember that tree? People take that story too literally and ask, oh, what's so bad in eating a fruit? But it is a symbolic situation. It's, it's symbolic. The tree of knowing good and bad represents man telling God, I don't trust in you. I will define what is good and bad for myself. I don't need you because I am my own God. So when God called the people to climb up the mountain, it was a reversal of the fall of man. According to our limited wisdom, the fruit is sweet and the fire is dangerous. But it's actually the other way around. So we eat the fruit and avoid the fire. But if we walk into the fire as God wants us to, we declare that, Lord, we trust in you. We declare that you are our God. If it is you, Lord, who called us to come out that burning mountain, I will go through the fire and go through the mountain. It's because it's you. That is our response today. But what is God's fire anyway? Let's discuss more on that. God's fire is, hmm, let's see. Again, the behavior of the nation when God called people to climb up the mountain, the behavior is, oh no, we'll just stay here. It's, it's self-preservation. Everybody say self-preservation. 
it's, it's, it's in the survival mode of the animal. I'm not gonna go where there's fire, where, where there's smoke, where there's danger, danger, danger. We will do anything to survive. And that is why we stay in our comfort zone and avoid courage zones, avoid what seems to be dangerous or unknown but a relationship with God. So here's the good news. The relationship with God is always dangerous. The world is, life is, and the relationship with God. At least, the relationship with God is dangerous. And when I say that, it's not just really it's dangerous. It's because it's dangerous to our sinfulness and our selfishness. God's fire is God's love. We allow ourselves to be loved by God. The tender love and also the tough love. God's fire purifies. God's love is dangerous because it will transform us forever. Here in the feast, this is where God is cooking our hearts through the fire of His love cooking our lives, cooking our minds, cooking our physical, so that after the feast, go out and feed. Go out and serve. Go out and love people. My dear friend, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of God's fiery love. Embrace it. Climb up the mountain. Walk into the fire. Hold the hand of the persons around you. Kung di mo kakilala, shoulder man lang. Can you just remind that person, my friend, God's invitation, walk into the fire. <laughs> Let's shift our mindset that fire makes us afraid. God is speaking to you today. The fire of God is God's love. And God's love will not harm you. God's love will heal you. Go through the fire. God spoke through Isaiah, coming from another part of the Bible, recalling this scene. I want you to remember the Red Sea, the burning mountain that we, we are in. And we're going to read this together and embrace this message, this call of God, this reassuring word of God. Let me say this with you, and if you could read this with me. From Isaiah 43. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire... You will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. My friend, brother, sister, will you still remain in front of the mountain? Will you remain in your comfort zone? Or will you say yes to this invitation to God to climb up that mountain? And yes, Go through the fire. And the reassurance is, when you go through the fire, you will not be burned. You will not be consumed. His love. It is an invitation to His love. It is an, it's a loving invitation. Will we say yes? It's reassuring. Please do not fear. I have called you by name. You are mine now. Kay Lord ka na. Hindi ka na kay devil my fire will not burn you. It will bless you. Who's ready for blessing? Walk through the fire. Climb up the mountain. And I'm going to pause a little bit here and say, our church, our feast gatherings, we're climbing up the mountain. We're going out of our comfort zone here. We're going to climb up to that unknown of going to that space. It's newly renovated. More parking. More comfortable. But I can sense people are, um, yeah, 
Not sure. 8 a.m., too early. 11 a.m., lunchtime. 2 p.m., ah, siesta time. It is God's loving invitation. God's invitation is not for us to have an easy life. We embrace it, even the hardships. And it's part of God's love. And their loving reminder is, even through the fire, I am with you. Do not be afraid. The fires, the trials, the tribulations, the hurts, the the, the limitations that you see, it will not be nothing. It will all, it's going to be all worth it. As an organization, as a church, as a family, feast family, we are going through that mountain. And that is where God will meet us. And God, God has already been with us actually from the very start. But this invitation, my dear friends, I hope we say yes. Because imagine, imagine if we miss, we miss it. What's the alternative? We could be feasting with God. We could be healing ourselves with Him. We could be experiencing joy like never before. We could be living in so much more abundance beyond our imaginings. If we walk through the fire, climb up that mountain. Here is message number three. Are you with me? God's fire will make you His light. Let's say that again. God's fire will make you His light. Exodus gives us an exciting glimpse of how the fire of God transforms. On the seventh time, seven. It's a... On a, for Bible nerds, that's very important. On the seventh time, Moses went up Mount Sinai to meet God. And Exodus says that, here it is, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. Moses got a facial, more than a facial, when he met the Lord. He became a picture of, of a transformed, transfigured person. Imagine if every Israel, I want you to use that imagination. What if? Imagine if every Israelite trusted God and they climbed up the fiery mountain. Every man, woman, child would have been glowing like Moses. Imagine what it would have been like. And you and I, my friends, the call is still true until today. God calls us to climb up that mountain, experience the fire of His love, be transformed like never before. And God calls you to shine. Touch the person beside you. Look at the face of that person. Study the face of that person. And just say to that person, God wants you to shine. <laughs> shine, shine, sunshine through my window. <laughs> Centuries later, Jesus said, Let your light, let your light shine before men. It still is true. Shine. That is His purpose for us. But as we go through the story, it's only Moses who was shining. And when we go through further in the Bible, you will see that even Moses, even the best of us, even a priest of God, a holy man of God, who was able to climb up the mountain, he eventually failed. When we explore the next book, the, the book of Numbers, we will read about the failed life of Moses. So what does God do? Even if his priest, even if, you know, 
despite the great miracles, despite great things, people are so stubborn. Oh, talk to me, Didoy. Yes. Just like you and me. What does God do? Even if Moses failed, what does God do? That is the God whom we serve. He never gives up on us. Jesus climbed up the mountain too. God provides us the perfect priest, the perfect mediator, the one who is a God who became human. He lived like us, breathed, ate, got hurt. He is one with us. He became one like us. His name is Jesus, that perfect mediator. And on behalf of every human, past, present, and future, He climbed up the mountain of Calvary. And there, He walked straight to death into the fire. But on the third day, he resurrected into new life. God's fire, God's invitation may be scary to love, to serve, to go to a Leo, to love my neighbor, to pay my taxes. To not be angry. <laughs> to, to live a life of integrity. And it looks like a death wish. But through the experience and the example of Jesus, going through the fire, especially the fire of God, it doesn't end with death. The same resurrection power that conquered the grave is with you and me today. Yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus went beyond his own fears and went beyond his natural desire for self-preservation. For our sake, Jesus embraced the difficult life. I'm going to give that invitation to you now. You are comfortably sitting down in a beautiful environment, cool space, beautiful lights, <clears throat> preacher. And even if you are watching online, internet is steady, the weather's fine, you're already thinking, what am I going to eat after? Where am I going to get my coffee? My amigas and amigos, we're going to meet afterwards. But right in this moment, I want you to focus here with me. And on behalf of God, not saying I'm a priest, but we are called to be God's priests. A holy nation. The invitation is, are you willing to climb up the mountain? You're not forced to live a hard life. But life is already hard. Might as well embrace it, right? You can have a hard life without God or have a hard life with God. Your choice. And remember, the fire leading up to that peak this looks like a death wish. But it will not result to death. It will result to eternal life. And that is not my invitation. I'm just echoing the invitation from the one who died and resurrected and now rescuing us all again and again and again.
It is so beautiful to be in the presence of God. And can we pray right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? I want you just to lift up to him all your needs, whatever you're going through. He knows what you're going through. He knows where you're coming from. He knows the burdens of your heart. Just just bring it up to God and say, Lord, I surrender everything that all hurt and all pain and all worries and all fear. Lift them all up to you, Lord. I surrender them to you are my king and you are the center of my life. And I trust you and I know that you are blessing me right now. I receive your love. I receive your joy. I receive your peace. I receive your healing. I receive your provision in Jesus name. Amen. And amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Live a fantastic life.